Okay, so I'm here with Lindsay Thompson, who's Professor of uh, Psych Forensic Psychiatry in Edinburgh. That's right. So, Lindsay, could you tell me a little bit about the work that you do in Scotland? So I'm a clinical forensic psychiatrist uh, with a patient ward at the State Hospital at Carstairs. That's the high secure hospital for Scotland and Northern Ireland. And I'm also medical director there. Uh, I'm director of the Forensic Network in the School of Forensic Mental Health in Scotland. Uh, the Forensic Network was established by the Scottish Government in 2003 to bring together all the forensic services for the purposes of planning, strategy development, short life working groups, operational issues, our continuous quality improvement cycles where we go around all of the services and we set the standards and education and training. And that really brings me to my last role and actually my employer, which is with the University of Edinburgh, where I'm actually say Professor of Forensic Psychiatry and there the remit is uh, education and training and that overlaps with the School of Forensic <coughs> So what would you say is one of the main things that you're concerned with at the moment in your work? My top clinical priority at the moment, uh, somewhat ironically, is actually the physical health of our patients. And that links to the research uh, presentation that we'll be giving at the conference here in Vienna. Uh, we have found in a long term, of 25 years now, a cohort of patients uh, that we've been studying. That's all 241 patients who were in the State Hospital in 1993. We followed them up for 10 years, those with schizophrenia, 169, and now we're following up 20 years plus all 241. And the study is uh, called a recovery study, mm -hmm. but the names proved to be somewhat ironic because one of the standout initial findings is that 93 of those 241 people are dead, very sadly. And when we look at uh, survival tables and what you would expect um, and we look at premature mortality the men are dying some 14 years earlier than normal life expectancy and the women 24 years so it's very significant that's a major it's a major issue and we know that there's a big problem particularly people who have severe mental health problems and of course so many people in forensic services are at the high you know the more severe end of, of mental health problems so, the question is, what can we do about it? Have you got any thoughts? Well, a um, number of years ago, we became an entirely smoke-free environment. So, when we look at those who have died, uh, in our cohort, there were only four suicides. Mm -hmm. A handful of drug and alcohol deaths, and about three uh, non-natural causes, so road traffic accidents or indeed people being assaulted. The vast majority were respiratory or cardiovascular deaths. So we went entirely smoke free uh, in December 2011. Mm -hmm. uh, our medium secure units have followed suit. Uh, the acceptability to our patients has been remarkable and attitudes have changed. Yes. The vast majority of them feel better, but still 50% want to smoke when they get the yeah. opportunity in the community. So that issue is still there, but that was a huge step forward for us. The other big problem is people being overweight mm. or obese. Now, we have a, a whole Scotland-wide forensic database and census that we carried out of all of our inpatients. And so we know that as a whole, 73% are obese and overweight. Mm. Now, it's 65% of adults in Scotland anyway. But the further up you go into the uh, security pyramid, the worse it gets. Right. So it's about 83-84% medium and high secure, and in the high secure, even more are in the obese range or in the overweight range. So at the State Hospital, we've introduced a 15 point program okay. uh, to try and tackle this issue. So we've, we've done what we can with the smoking, although more to do across the network as a whole. Our next big target is the obesity because of all the secondary effects on the Yeah, health because, health. Because, because we know obesity links to increased rates of diabetes, increased rates of cardiovascular disease, and we have all of that. Yes, we have all of that. So it's this 15 point plan that we've been taking forward. And is that what you're going to be talking about in the, in the session at the, at the conference? Yeah. Absolutely. So I'm not going through all 15 points, but it goes from uh, the straightforward educational programs for both patients and carers as they're crucial to all of this, access to exercise, 
size, consistency in our menus and the recipes that are used and the size of portions that are delivered. Uh, but the more major aspects have been, uh, we have been the first uh, healthy shop NHS Scotland in, in Scotland. Now that's a requirement, legislative requirement of the Scottish Government. We were the first to meet it and what it means is you're supposed to have 50-50 healthy products and confectionery or whatever else. We've actually gone for 80-20, okay. so it's 80% healthy. Now I have to say that the unhealthy gets replenished more often of course, mm -hmm. that's the downside, but we've got the shop initiative. Uh, a major exercise initiative and an uh, electronic record of all exercise that patients take. So you can chart it, you can actually have a lovely table showing this to you in the weekly clinical team meetings. And another big initiative has been stopping external procurement. And that's what you and I would know as Tesco Direct, oh, yeah. whatever else yeah. you want to use. And takeaways. And, uh, <laughs> we allow takeaways once a month. Okay. So, you know, don't so stop everything. Limiting, yeah, limiting, absolutely. Allowing but limiting, everything in moderation. Which is what we would do. Yeah. Um, the one thing we have stopped is this external procurement. Um, it will have started as a kindness and yeah. it turned into a mass industry. We were using 1.4 full-time members of staff to take the orders, receive, divide up for patients, deliver out, mm. uh, and it was increasing our health problems. So it seemed to us that that was wrong. Yeah. So we have stopped that. And the last big initiative, which we're halfway through uh, introducing, is health and wellbeing plans. Okay, brilliant. So this is something that um, you're working on in Scotland. Hopefully in two to three years' time, you'll be able to give us some really positive outcomes. And this is something that we're going to be able to, hopefully, trans you know, um, disseminate across the country. Well, I very much hope so. I will be presenting some results today. Uh, these are early findings. And if we look at it as a population as a whole, it's not encouraging. So we came up with a plan in 2016. We're now early 2019. Roughly still about 83% obese and overweight. Yeah. However, the population is not static. It's about 30 in and out each year. So it's not the same people in that cohort. We divide into two groups, the admission group, mm. uh, where you're really trying for prevention, and then the, the ongoing patient group, where the damage may already have been done, where you're going for reduction or treatment. Yeah. There are early indicators in the admission group that actually the level of weight gain has gone down since these initiatives, particularly the procurement, has taken place. So people place. are more likely to remain weight neutral, not necessarily the big gains that you would get in the first three months typically. Which has been a quarter or a third of body weight yeah. in those first 12 months. It's now down to about 12%. That's fantastic. Now, it's very early days, uh, so we need to see if that is maintained. The other thing we can see is that we have £20,000 less uh, spending on food items uh, since the removal of the external procurement. So yes, the shop did increase, but it's, there's still this um, reduction by £20,000, which we would hope would have uh, a longer term effect. Excellent. So it looks like we're going to have some clinical effectiveness, but also it's really cost effective too. So it's something that we really should everybody should be taking note of. Absolutely, I mean, at the moment, with our premature mortality rates, we have services that are causing difficulties to patients, yeah. unintended difficulties, and we've got to tackle these. The question now is, for those patients who uh, may have a health and wellbeing plan, they may have the exercise plan, the programs, the dietary advice, um, and have agreed to what they're going to purchase and so on. If they then don't do it, how much can you enforce it? And I'm not talking about patients who lack capacity. It's that autonomy versus duty of care, yeah. and that's the balance. And we're going to test that out with some of our patients who are morbidly obese, so their risk of death is very high yeah. to see and take some legal advice as to how much we can truly um, push these boundaries for our duty of care. We've involved our Mental Welfare Commission, yeah. which has responsibilities for individual yeah. patients, and they understand the tension of what we're trying to do between the liberty, and this is one area where patients truly yeah. do have choice, and yet, the adverse effects on the physical health. So it's a very fine balance. Well, this is fantastic because it's such a it is a difficult um, it's a difficult uh, you know 
problem to sort out. We know that people have uh, issues around um, their weight and their physical health, and we're not very good at attending to that. But with the, as you say, balancing against their autonomy and what they might want to do and the choices that they have, and that's like everybody else. But we, um, we're so grateful to you for tackling this because one of the big questions is how do we manage that population of people who are obese but who have capacity and who don't feel that they want to do anything about their health, their physical health. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you.